Um, our next speaker here uh, is the CEO of Just Park. Uh, he's an expert on the sharing economy and the author of the definitive guide, The Business of Sharing. He's uh, appeared on countless television stations around the world talking about the subject. Ladies and gentlemen, would you give a very warm round of applause, please, to Alex Stephanie. Thank you. Just Park, we're reinventing parking for the digital era. Parking is one of the most dysfunctional parts of city life, and that's no surprise. It's barely changed in decades. Our website and app lets drivers find and book empty parking spaces, whether at car parks, churches, pubs, hotels, or even on empty private driveways. We're unlocking these hidden parking spaces so you never have to deal with the stress and uncertainty of circling the streets. Using Just Park, drivers can secure a convenient parking space in seconds either in advance or on the spot. The average just park space costs less than half the price of the on-street alternative. Meanwhile, property owners make a second income by renting out their underused parking spaces with Just Park. Just Park is the European leader in online parking. On the one hand, we have over half a million drivers, and on the other, we have 150,000 parking spaces. We've been covered by everyone, from the BBC, Bloomberg and the Financial Times, to ITV, CNBC, and CNN. We've attracted investment from two of the world's most prestigious investors, BMW and Europe's leading tech investors, Index Ventures. So I personally met Anthony five years ago now, at the beginning of our venture capital business, and it was great to see an innovation coming out of the UK. It's really maximizing what is a scarce resource in every city, and that's space. One of the great innovations we implemented was the integration of just park in the Mini. So that was a world's first where you can actually book and pay from parking within a car. To get rid of parking pain has got to be good. It's good for the parker, it's good for the city, it's good for the environment. Just Park has touched a nerve in the market space. Technology is right, the team is right. This is going to be big. I love the way Just Park have executed their, their vision. They really are dedicated to solving a, a problem. This is not a brand new startup. This is a company that's been running since 2006. They've been building their capability, their knowledge of the problem. And they've embraced the new technologies like the, the smartphone extremely well. I think they've also built an organization that is, is really capable of uh, expanding this business internationally. This is a global problem and uh, I believe they have a global solution. Just Park doesn't only help families to make a second income from their driveways. We also work with some of the UK's largest brands, from leading hotel chains like the Hilton to major car park groups like NCP. Just Park is fast becoming the first port of call for drivers looking to park. One of the best things about Just Park is that because you book your parking ahead of time, which you can't do otherwise, it makes your journey completely stress-free. I think the good thing about Just Park is, obviously it's lucrative, and it's all done automatically by the Just Park team. It's a very easy process. At the moment, our particular project that we're using the parking money for is that we have to repair the portico roof. And it's wonderful to have an income stream like this parking that we can rely on. So it's been um, truly excellent for us. Here at Novotel London Waterloo, we have 40 car park spaces. It was something we had been looking in the past, how to promote the car park service, how to uh, maximise the space we have in our car park. I would recommend Just Park to any other hotels or business as a way of maximising the space they have. I have saved a lot of money using Just Park, especially compared with on-street parking. In, in terms of the earnings, uh, I don't do anything particularly special with it, but it's, it's really beneficial because it goes into my mortgage pot and helps me pay that bill every month. People have always been really excited by our solution to the parking problem. And we believe the best way to build a large and profitable business is to tap into this enthusiasm. We have a chance to reshape the parking industry in the same way that others have reshaped the hotel and taxi industries and solve a problem experienced in every major city across the world. In the process, we are improving lives, reducing congestion, and putting money back into people's pockets. We hope you'll join us on this exciting journey.
Hi, good morning, everyone. So, uh, my name's Alex Stephanie. I'm CEO of Just Park. And I want to talk to you about the sharing economy, or more specifically, the business aspects of this sharing economy. Now, the 20th century was a very messy century by really any estimation. But in at least one respect, it was quite straightforward. If you wanted goods, if you wanted services, you went to a company. And in the second half of that century, in some countries, you might go to government, you might go to national government, you might go to local government. But the point is this, you knew what a company was, you knew what a government was. Now, these organizations are becoming problematized, they're becoming, uh, they, they have new competitors. And the competitors are us, the people in this room, and the billions of other people. Because these days, if you want a hotel room, you don't need to go to a big hotel group. That hotel room can be provided by an individual in their home. If you want a loan, you don't need to go to a bank because that finance can be provided by an individual. And as you've just seen, if you want a parking space, you don't need to go to your local government and park on the street. You can go to an individual who might provide that space. I wear two hats. The first is of, uh, as a CEO of Just Park. Um, actually, that, that video is slightly out of date now. We've got about three quarters of a million drivers. Um, and it's quite, a phenomenal, um, it's quite a phenomenal thing, really. This is only parking, but if people were to think that almost a million people, probably get to a million people this year in the UK, might be actually using other people's spaces as an alternative to spaces provided by governments and companies, then I think it just goes to show what the potential is of these peer-to-peer -peer models. And the other thing I do is, is I'm a writer. Um, I've written a book called The Business of Sharing, which is the insider's guide to the sharing economy, and it was published by Macmillan a couple of months ago. I've always been of the opinion that there are plenty enough business books in the world. And so when I was asked to write this, I, I was very wary at first, but I wrote it on the condition that it wouldn't just be another dry business book. And so it's very much a fly-on-the-wall description of what it's like to run one of these sharing economy businesses. So that means that in the chapter on investors, I talk about what it's like to go and pitch a business to a fund like Sequoia Capital, which is maybe the most prestigious venture capital firm in Silicon Valley. Um, I talk about the discussions I've had with governments about regulation relating to the sharing economy and Just Park and trips I made to, to Downing Street to have those discussions. Um, and I tell the stories of people in my own network so people that have started other businesses um, as or more successful than Just Park, businesses that you'll know. So I got to interview the founders of companies like Airbnb and Zipcar. I listened to them about the challenges and the joys of starting one of these sharing economy businesses. Let's delve a little bit deeper. What is this whole sharing economy thing? Um, can I have a quick show of hands? How many people have heard of this concept? So probably about 90% of the people in the room. And as I just mentioned, this is really at root about what is it like to get goods and services from other people rather than from companies. And very often, those goods and services are things that we already own. What is the potential, in other words, for the people in this room and out there to disintermediate companies and do more cheaply, more efficiently what those companies were doing previously? So there are five limbs to the definition I give in the business of sharing. Firstly, I'm very interested in value. This is economic, financial value. Now, people have always been giving away things, sharing things through charitable shops, thrift stores in the US, as they're called, um, and providing um, their own spare expertise, goods, services to other people. But I'm interested in how these things can now be monetized, and people can make money from the provision of these goods and services. The second is that the sharing economy is the value in taking these underutilized assets. Okay? Now, these assets might be tangible ones. It might be a case of me taking a trip to Wales to talk at a conference and renting out the tangible asset of my flat. It might mean me jumping on a train and not using my car during the days or for weeks on end and renting out my car to other people. But they also might be intangible assets. That might be time 
or expertise. These assets are then made accessible online. So the sharing economy is just not possible without the scale that the internet brings, particularly when that scale is supercharged by mobile penetration and smartphone penetration. So that means that people can put their assets online and billions of people can see those assets. And one of my favorite stories is to do with the founding of, of eBay by a guy called Pierre Omidyar. Um, I don't know if you know the origin of this, um, but he was trying to work out if eBay was a potentially big and scalable business. And so he built a prototype website, and he decided to list a piece of crap, frankly, that he had, which was a broken laser pointer. And so he did a test listing of this broken laser pointer. And to his astonishment, this tin pot, unknown website called eBay um, somehow got some traffic, and someone sent him a message and said, hey, um, thanks for listing your laser pointer. Um, I'd love to buy it. Here's my address. I'll send you the transfer. And then Pierre replied and said, hang on a second. I think you're confused. This laser pointer is broken. And the guy said, actually, I buy and collect and repair broken laser pointers. So it was at that point that Omidyar realized that this was a massive opportunity and that the scale of the internet made these kinds of platforms possible for the first time in history. The other thing is that you're making all these underused assets of value available to a community. Now, an interesting characteristic of all of these platforms is that they have people who self-identify. And these people stand up for the values in those communities. They are values laden. If they come under regulatory attack, they group together and they lobby for that community. And there are values that go throughout them. It is, more, it is about more than just supply of commodities. And the final thing is that these platforms lead to a reduced need to actually own these assets. In that respect, think of a business like Zipcar compared to a standard rental car company. Arrive at an airport, take a rental car, what you're getting is an extra car. It's a supplemental car. It doesn't actually change the number of cars that people own per capita. Arguably, it increases them. But a zip car is substitutionary to car ownership. And that's something that you see throughout these platforms. People are able to get their hands on stuff, to rent stuff, and that's replacing the need to actually own it in the first place. Why are they doing that? Because it can be cheaper, it can be more convenient. I think there are strong moral overtones to the sharing economy, and that's part of the way it's been branded, I think. But actually, as an entrepreneur, what interests me about these models, and certainly what interests all of the investors that I interviewed, is that they make pure economic sense. They are efficient. Look at a business like um, Lending Club that just IPO'd in the US. This is a peer-to-peer -peer lender. Now, by taking out all of the incredibly high overheads of a bank, they're able just to provide finance cheaper than a bank. They have an operational expense ratio of under 2%. A bank has one of more than 5%, sort of 5 to 7%. So these guys are able to provide debt more cheaply. And this is a trend that you see throughout the sharing economy. This is just, more, this is just a more efficient model. Um, so at Just Park, there are kind of two efficiencies that I like to think about. The first is the efficient use of space. In the UK, there are about 20,000 families and individuals renting out their driveways. Now, clearly, this space was very inefficiently used before. Very often, it wasn't being used at all. So there was absolute 0% utilization. Other times, we might be working with a car park or a hotel or a church that are using their spaces some of the time. And the other efficiency that we, that we leverage is efficient journeys. How many of you drive and park in, in a city center like Cardiff? Some of the time you're going to know where you're going to park, but some of the time you're not, and you're going to drive around and around. And when you do that, you cause a bit of traffic and you cause pollution and scale up that experience of driving around looking for parking by the billions of car journeys every day, and you realize that we have a significant global problem. As much as 30% of all the traffic and car pollution in certain CBDs of cities is caused by people looking for parking, and it's very rarely below 
This is a scandalous problem that people aren't really aware of. And so this route of arrive your destination, circle round and round and round, needs to be replaced by drive to a space where you know you can park, drive to a space that you have booked. It's pure common sense, and we think that's what everyone's going to be doing because it saves you time, it saves you money. There's also a third efficiency that we've tapped into um, in the last few months. That video that you just saw was actually made as part of a campaign to do an equity crowdfunding round. Um, it was a pretty successful round. It was the largest equity crowdfunding round um, that a tech uh, startup had ever done. So we raised the maximum that it could raise, that was 5 million euros. And we raised it from uh, almost 3,000 people, of whom 1,000 were our customers. And again, this is a peer-to-peer -peer platform, people investing, directing companies through a website that is making possible new efficiencies. Imagine the process of a stockbroker selling tiny amounts of shares to 3,000 people. Some people are investing as little as 10 pounds. It's just not possible without the efficiency of these peer-to-peer -peer platforms. So I'm just going to touch on a few themes that um, I bring up in, in the sharing economy. Um, and one is how it's changing our notion of investing. So one of the interviews um, I did in the book is with a guy called Jeff Jordan, who's a VC at a fund called Andreessen Horowitz um, in Silicon Valley. It's this, probably the sort of trendiest, coolest fund right now in the States. And they have invested in, in a bunch of companies uh, Airbnb is the most famous one in, in this particular sector. And what Jeff said to me is that when he's looking at investing in some of these platforms, he looks down what he calls the balance sheet of life. It's a very sort of typically sort of VC type term. What he's saying is he looks at your most expensive stuff first. And so that's stuff like your house. And then moving down the balance sheet, it's your car. It might be your, your furniture, your designer clothes, your jewelry. And he's thinking about ways that he, as a VC, can tap into some of the transactional value, some of the value of the idling capacity that we see here. If you have an expensive necklace that you wear twice a year, clearly there are other people that would pay something to wear that necklace on other occasions. Can you build a platform where you can tap into that idling capacity? And what you're seeing from a non-VC perspective now is what I call the buy-to-share model. Okay, so probably maybe no one in this room is a VC, but I imagine some of you have buy-to-let properties or you've bought other assets that you're trying to rent out. People are finding now that you can buy assets and put them on these platforms and get a better yield. So if you're buy-to-let landlords, you'll probably know that you're going to get a better yield from your property renting it out 40 times a year for one week than finding someone to take it once for 52 weeks. And that's just administratively very painful and complex in a world without some of these platforms that have built the tools for you. But if you can do that and have this very, very high throughput and high liquidity, then you can actually get greater yield. Um, and that's what Airbnb have found. It's why they've been able to get a lot of inventory onto their platform. And it's exactly what we do at Just Park. So people who rent out their driveway or a parking space long term for one person are able to get way, way less income off that asset than if they open it up and have high liquidity. So the, the spaces on Just Park, many of them are used more than once a day as cars just come and go, and we manage this through our own system. Of course, that's just unworkable if you're doing it yourself without the tools. Another thing that's worth pointing out about all of these platforms is that they are marketplaces. They have supply, they have demand. A marketplace is a pretty beautiful thing. Someone pointed out to me the other day that they almost certainly predate money because really it's just this concept that people come together um, and that you have this meeting of, of needs and wants with people that actually can meet those needs and wants. And they're really hard to get to scale. They're really hard to build. But if you can get a marketplace to scale like an Airbnb, like an eBay, these businesses can be huge they can be very, very high margin. They tend to be sort of winner takes all. And they exhibit what are called network effects. So what that means is that each additional unit into the marketplace is of more value than the previous unit because it sucks in more buyers and it provides more inventory. 
The sharing economy is also opening up investments in people themselves, which is quite a strange and meta kind of concept. So there's platforms in the US that are allowing people to sponsor individuals and effectively take kind of receivables of their future earnings. So again, this is sort of the definition, really, of a peer-to-peer -peer model. You're actually investing directly in a human being rather than, say, depositing your cash in a bank that might lend out that cash to that person um, and will take a huge amount of the fat for themselves along the way. Um, and also investing in, in real assets themselves. That's the point I just made before about this buy-to-share model. An interesting development of these peer-to-peer -peer platforms is that some of them are becoming more like B2C platforms. And we're now in a really interesting state of flux where people are working out what is the best business model. So I said at the outset that we've been moving from this world where people get stuff from companies to a world in which they get stuff from people. Now, it's not that simple. Actually, there are advantages to both types of service provision. And platforms like us and the big, big companies are trying to work out, you know, what is the optimal way to provide goods and services? What is the optimal business model? So Just Park's story is that it used to be called Park at My House. And it was a platform that was purely peer-to-peer. -peer. This was purely about individuals with driveways renting them out. And it worked really well and several hundred thousand drivers joined the platform. But of course, these drivers didn't only want to park in driveways, they also needed to park in city centers, where certainly in London, where I grew up, you don't have too many driveways. So what we did is we layered this kind of B2C platform on top and rebranded it Just Park. And what you're seeing now is that some of these peer-to-peer -peer platforms are striving for the kind of standardization that the big companies have, and that equally, these big companies are striving for some of the personalization that the small companies have, that the peer-to-peer -peer platforms have. And I think it's a really interesting time um, to be looking at this area now, because you're going to be seeing this jostling, this coming together. Um, as people work out what the business models are, I think it's always very tempting to you know, look at these big companies and assume that, broadly speaking, they have got it right. I think that's a bit of a false assumption. Um, if you look at a business like Hilton, it's an incredibly slick operation. But why have they not brought out a service like Hilton Homes, where they have a curated marketplace of high-value properties, and rather than just taking one room in that hotel, an executive might rent out an entire luxury home at much greater cost. And that home is serviced by the hotel staff, um, and the guests can use the hotel facilities, and so on. And why haven't they done it? probably because they're a mixture of afraid and just a big company that's not able to move fast enough for that kind of operational change. I think we're going to be seeing a lot of things like that. In fact, Hyatt recently just participated in a funding round for another company called One Fine Stay, which is a little bit like Airbnb, but provides uh, much more uh, consistently luxurious properties. So here you can see Airbnb, the biggest name in the sharing economy space, thinking about personalization. Now, some people like quirky trips, but most people are a little bit more conservative, a little bit less adventurous. They like, they like getting what they expect. They like knowing what they're going to get. Um, and so here you can see um, an effort by Airbnb to enforce some standardization. Um, so you can see that they uh, are saying, every home is different, and you should be sure to consider what your specific listing requires. And then they say, meet regulations, put in fire extinguishers and carbon monoxide, and make sure that you remove all these hazards and things like that. It's an effort to make a more hotel-like experience. And then personalization of incumbents. Some, a couple of things that you may have seen. Nike, they had a huge success with allowing people to design their own trainers. Coca-Cola, another big success, allowing people to pick named bottles. And what you're seeing is a sort of subconscious return to them saying, let's be like a small company that provides handmade, almost artisanal type products. So where is this all going? Um, I think where next is, is the sort of fundamental question here. Um, I'm sure all of you have seen 
scenes like that top image. You've been in a developing country and you've seen people just bundling onto something, bundling onto a train, bundling onto a bus. Um, and these are places where people are just much more used to sharing. Sure, we have parks and we have shared gyms and things like that, but we don't so freely share all of our assets as we do in the developing world, where there are more people and there are less things. It is simply necessity that, that creates that kind of behavior. And platforms are tapping into this. Blah Blah Car is a ride, long distance ride sharing company. So what they do is allow someone to list a journey. They're driving from, say, Cardiff to Swansea, um, but they have some empty seats. So simply what they do is sell those seats and then some strangers jump in their car. Now, it feels a bit unnatural probably if you've grown up and lived all your life in Wales to be doing that, but it's far from unnatural if you're maybe grown up in, in South Asia and you would happily take someone in your car for a little bit of cash. Another example of that is Airbnb that launched um, in Cuba recently. So how many of you open up your homes and invite people to have dinner there for money? That's not a surprise. We don't do this, okay? We could do this, and some of us could be able to probably make some decent money for a good cooks, but we don't. We keep ourselves to ourselves. It's very much the sort of Northern European way. But in Cuba, they don't do this. So you have these, this concept of paladares, and you have thousands of family-run restaurants. They're just homes. They're just usually the matriarch in that family preparing a family meal and supplementing their income by just selling tickets to people. And so Airbnb is tapping in to these existing forms of behavior. What kind of what kind of macro trends are we going to be seeing as well in terms of the business model? So these are mostly consumer phenomena. okay? They're speaking to you as a consumer. Get a nice meal, rent a car, get a cheap hotel room for your next trip. They're servicing consumers. But I think what we're going to see in the next decade is that a lot of these platforms, because they are more efficient, are going to start servicing businesses. A couple of examples here. So this is a business called Cohelo. I don't know if any of you work in the medical sector or healthcare and are aware of the amount of idling capacity that you see in hospital hardware. What these guys have done is they've said, okay, this doesn't make any sense. Why should you only be using a dialysis machine for four days a week? Can we build an online marketplace where hospitals can trade some of their machines between them and make sure that these things are actually much more efficiently used? Another one is machinery link. So this is doing the same, but for massively expensive combine harvesters. So think about the North American continent. Obviously, the weather is very different at different times of year, and so therefore the harvest is different. Um, it, starts in the, it starts in Texas, and it moves up and finally finishes in the Pacific Northwest. Now, sure, it's a bit of a hassle moving a combine harvester around the North American continent, but it's likely to be much cheaper than every single farmer in the US owning one of these enormous machines and servicing and maintaining one of these enormous machines. And Machinery Link is a platform that allows farmers to access combine harvesters without buying them. So thank you very much for listening. Um, I think we're out of time now, um, so no time for questions, unfortunately. But uh, yeah, it's been great, great meeting you and talking to you, and, and thank you again. Thank mm -hmm. you.